This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is The World Today. Hello, I'm Jamie Owen. Welcome to the program. Our top stories. China's President Xi Jinping greets former top United States diplomat Henry Kissinger, the man credited with bringing the two countries together in the 1970s. Our other headlines, Ukraine's port cities under attack for a third night as EU ministers warn of a global food crisis. Wildfires across Greece are largely contained after burning huge areas of forests, but there are now warnings of a new heat wave to come. And join me for some swanning about on the river as the annual and very traditional swan count takes place on the River Thames. China's President Xi Jinping has told Henry Kissinger that old friends like him will not be forgotten as he met the 100-year-old former U.S. Secretary of State in Beijing. President Xi greeted Kissinger at the guest house where he was received during his first visit to the country in 1971. Since then, the veteran diplomat has visited China more than 100 times. Kissinger played a key role in normalizing diplomatic ties between Washington and Beijing and President Xi has praised his contribution. The Chinese people never forget old friends and the name Kissinger will always be associated with China-US relations. The Chinese people will always remember. I hold you in high regard. Well, Dr. Wang Huiao is founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. Welcome to the program. Just how symbolic is this meeting? Well, I think this meeting is very uh, significant and it's very timely and it's very crucial, actually. You know, first of all, I think that Dr. Kissinger has, uh, uh, you know, witnessed the uh, uh, establishment of a diplomatic ties and actually he was the uh, one of the founders of uh, China-U.S. Uh, modern relations. And uh, so he personally come again and uh, shows that even at uh, 100 years old, which is China 100 years time, still attach such a great importance to the China-U.S. relations. So that's really uh, very significant. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I think also we're seeing some uh, new movement now. I mean, we After Blinken's visit, after Yellen's visit, after <laughs> a John Kerry visit, now we have a Kissinger come. So. That shows that uh, there's uh, there's momentum that's uh, gradually building up uh, to better, you know, understanding each other and also better promoting the relations. So we hope to stabilize and uh, and looking forward probably lift up some of the relations. So that just injected big confidence in some people-to-people -people exchanges. So I think uh, President Xi also mentioned that China will not forget old friends, and, and we have many old friends, and I think that... Uh, so this is great uh, encouragement for people who are promoting the China-U.S. relation. Uh, that is really important that we did. many people like Dr. Kissinger and really care about China-U.S. relation, and that is very important. He's also had uh, other meetings, including uh, a meeting with uh, China's senior diplomat Wang Yi. What do you think Kissinger intends, if anything, to achieve during this trip, or is it just about pictures and warm words? Well, I think that there's probably both. Uh, uh, we all need them. First of all, I think he come to uh, come uh, with some substantial dialogue with the senior diplomats, senior defense officials, and including President Xi. And uh, because Kissinger is is uh, really a, a, a focal point and actually uh, an information center for China-U.S. relations, he has uh, all the latest information, and he has the uh, uh, reflection on both sides. So <clears throat> to hear his view, it will help better understanding uh, bilateral relations and actually. Also, he can pass the words back to the uh, U.S. administration to really uh, have a better understanding on, on the other side as well. So I think that this kind of a messenger uh, a dialogue uh, uh, promoter uh, is, is very important. Second, I think also the, the pictures and uh, photo ops and uh, occasions to, uh, the, you know, one picture was a thousand words. I mean, he came to China personally. Even at 100 years old, after 100 years birthday, that's such a touching, moving gesture and uh, and such an encouraging gesture for uh, a century-old uh, <laughs> gentleman like him. He's overcome so much difficult, come to China, 
attaches great importance of China-U.S. relation. That is itself. It's it's sending a you know a, a million words to the people around the world that China-U.S. relation is still the most important bilateral relation. We have to you know uh, stick to that, and we have to really uh, uphold and uh, hold it dear. To so so it's very important. The United States has stressed that Kissinger is visiting in his capacity as a private citizen. Um, do you think his visit has some um, traction with the administration in the U.S.? Well, I think he has uh, many, uh, you know, colleagues, many uh, students, many, a lot of people in the administration was, uh, of course, influenced or impacted by him. I think officially they may not say he doesn't uh, re represent official because the U.S. has many uh, secretary of cabinet visiting. We still have uh, Raimondo to come. We have uh, many Chinese uh, ministers to go. Uh, also, President Xi and President Biden probably going to meet at the G20 in September and possibly November at APEC summit. Uh, so I think, you know, Dr. Kissinger is representing the people-to-people -people exchange, but at a high level. He really knows the history, background, uh, the, 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 and then the advice he gave, you know, we, we cannot afford uh, to have a conflict, and we really have to maximize uh, our, our benefit in interests of both sides. And actually, we have to coexist uh, peacefully. And that's the message he's giving is, is really uh, very important and very uh, uh, timely uh, as China-U.S. relations is going downstream. And uh, so, so I think that even though the administration uh, openly said, OK, he doesn't represent the official views, but, but I think, you know, that, that I'm sure his uh, uh, exchanges, his, his uh, uh, advices, his uh, findings will influence uh, both, uh, both sides, uh, for sure. That, that's very useful as well. Dr. Wang Huwao, founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Russia has carried out a third night of airstrikes on Ukrainian ports days after it withdrew from the deal allowing grain to be exported from the country. Several residential buildings were hit in Mykolaiv, injuring at least 19 people, including five children. In Odessa, a security guard was killed and at least eight other people hurt. Ukraine's military said 19 missiles and 19 drones were launched overnight, some of which were intercepted. Well, EU foreign ministers are meeting in Brussels to discuss military support for Ukraine, including a proposal to supply $22 billion in aid over the next four years. Our correspondent Alex Cadier is watching events for us in Brussels. Alex, uh, firstly, what's the uh, EU's reaction to those uh, continuing attacks on uh, Ukraine's ports? Well, Jamie, concern and condemnation, those would be the two uh, words I'd use to describe the European reaction. We heard from Josep Borrell, the EU's top diplomat, uh, just a few hours ago, responding to uh, those attacks, specifically responding to the allegation or to the, to the reports that uh, grain silos were targeted in Odessa, saying that that is an escalation from Russia. Before, when the Black Sea grain deal wasn't operational and ships couldn't sail, in that corridor, at least the grain on land was being left alone. And now this seems to be an escalation, according to the European Union. There's also uh, the message from Josep Borrell was very clear. Well, there's only one solution to this, more military support for Ukraine to reinforce their defenses and prevent these kinds of attacks from happening in the first place. And that uh, is really what those foreign ministers will be talking about. They'll be meeting with Anthony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State. They'll be uh, meeting with uh, Dmitry Kuleba, the foreign uh, minister of Ukraine, hearing updates on the ground, hearing updates from those uh, missile barrages on those coastal cities, on Odessa, on those grain silos, and trying to formulate a response as quickly as possible. It is the third night that massive aerial attacks against Odessa port and infrastructure is causing not only civilian casualties, but a big destruction of the grain storage there. What we already know is that this is going to create a big a huge food crisis in the world. Alex, tell us more about this uh, new funding to support Ukraine's military. Well, as you said, $22 billion over four years. The message from the EU there is that they are in it for the long haul. They don't want to just uh, support Ukraine so long as uh, the invasion is ongoing. It's actually a longer-term 
package of support for the Ukrainian military. Now, it isn't a direct uh, support from the European Union. It isn't the EU itself buying weaponry or financing weaponry for uh, Ukraine. It is actually the European Union refunding or paying back member states who decide to supply uh, uh, weapons from uh, their stocks to Ukraine. So if Poland decides to send more tanks, if Lithuania decides to send uh, air defense uh, 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 systems or things like that, the EU will then uh, reimburse and pay back those donations. The money can also be used to train Ukrainian soldiers, but really a clear sign from the EU that even if the invasion were to stop tomorrow, they are in it to support Ukraine to make sure that not only the invasion ends, but also Ukraine can, can, is able to sustain its defense in the longer term, Jamie. Alex, thank you for that. Our correspondent Alex Cadier in Brussels. Russia has warned that all ships traveling to Ukraine's Black Sea ports will be considered potential military targets, as Kyiv said it would set up a temporary shipping route to continue grain exports following Moscow's withdrawal from that deal. President Putin has accused the West of using the deal as a form of political blackmail. Let's talk to our correspondent Dasha Chernyshova in Moscow. Dasha, um, what are we hearing from uh, Putin on the future of this grain exporting deal. Well, as we understand, the Russian authorities have sent a very strong message to the rest of the world, saying that Russia wants to see the promises uh, that have been made under this Black Sea grain deal uh, actually fulfilled for the Russian Federation. That is, of course, with regards to the memorandum that was signed between the United Nations and Russia that Russia says has never been implemented. A number of issues from the SWIFT bank, uh, payment system to insurances are freight for the Russian vessels. But at the moment, the Russian Federation is sending a very clear message. Without any progress, in three months, Russia would not be willing to return to this deal. But if those positions and provisions are implemented, that Russia will immediately consider rejoining the Black Sea Grain Initiative. That's according to the Russian President Vladimir Putin. He was also saying that uh, the other precondition for Russia's return to the deal would be the restoration of what he called the initial humanitarian essence of this grain deal, suggesting that this deal has been actually twisted by the West Western countries, while the European companies have been profiting from this deal. And it also stressed that the poorest countries of the world, of the world have not received more than 3 percent of all the grain that has been exported from Ukraine during the duration of uh, this uh, grain deal. And also the Russian president was stressing that at the moment Russia is willing to supply all of the grain that was shipped from Ukraine on the charitable and commercial basis, and it is able to do so to any country that is requesting to do so. So Russia's position here is very clear. Russia, Russia wants to see some concrete results with regards to the implementation of its part of the deal. Otherwise, Russia is not interested in returning back to this initiative. And more of uh, what are being called retaliatory strikes from Moscow. Um, what's the latest there? Well, that's right. For the third day now, we keep hearing from Russia's Ministry of Defense the confirmation that they are carrying out the strikes against the military targets near the city of Odessa, that's the port city. We have heard that they have been destroying the workshops and the storage facilities in the area of the city of Odessa, as well as Ilichevsk in this uh, Odessa region. Russia insists they have been destroying the fuel storage facilities in the area of the city of Nikolaev. So the ammunition depots and the fuel storages in the area of those port cities have been under the increased challenge from the Russian armed forces. Russia insists that it's using the high-precision weapons to eliminate those targets, while all of those designated targets have been destroyed. But also, Russia says this is in retaliation for the Ukrainian uh, terrorist act, as Russia describes it, against the Crimean bridge that took place earlier this week. It killed two people who have been buried. They have been from Belgrade region, which is also the region that comes under increased challenge from the Ukrainian side and orphaned a 14-year-old girl. Dasha, thank you for that. Our correspondent Dasha Chernyshova in Moscow. Iraq has asked Sweden's ambassador to leave and warned it will sever diplomatic ties if a Quran is burned in Sweden again. Hundreds of people stormed the Swedish embassy in the capital Baghdad, setting it alight in protest against a second planned burning of the Muslim holy book during a demonstration in Stockholm. The Swedish government is considering ratifying a law giving police powers to stop people from setting fire to the Quran in public if it endangers national security. 
Three people have been killed and five injured in a shooting in Auckland. The gunman has not been formally identified, but is believed to be a 24-year-old man employed at the construction site where the shooting took place. New Zealand's Prime Minister Hipkins said the shooting appeared to be the actions of an individual and there was no risk to national security. The incident took place hours ahead of the Women's Football World Cup opening. There have been protests in India after video of two women paraded naked and assaulted on the street went viral. It happened in Manipur's state, which has been hit by violent ethnic clashes. On Thursday, India's parliament session was disrupted as lawmakers demanded a, a debate on the issue. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has condemned the assault as shameful. You're watching CGTN, still ahead. Greek firefighters make progress against wildfires, but there are fears of a new heat wave, which could bring more misery. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos and unicorn companies. Make sense of it all with global business only on CGTF. There's a new agenda for a new world, accelerating change in almost every part of our lives. It's shifting the norms of how we work, travel, and connect. How we think, interact, and develop. It's a new reality, a new agenda with me, Juliet Mann. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more just got to be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why, this is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Hello, welcome back. A reminder of our top stories. China's President Xi Jinping greets former top United States diplomat Henry Kissinger, the man credited with bringing the two countries together in the 1970s. Our other headlines, Ukraine's port cities under attack for a third night as EU ministers warn of a global food crisis. Spain heads to the polls on Sunday for the first time since 2019. The latest projections put the centre-right popular party in the lead, but they may need the help of the far-right party Vox to secure power. Our correspondent Ken Brown reports. This is Santiago Abascal, the leader of Vox. His party are in the ascendancy and could be just days away from being in power as a junior coalition partner. That would put the far right back in government for the first time since General Francisco Franco in the 1970s. Its supporters feel that they haven't been represented by mainstream politics. Here in Toledo, an hour outside Madrid, there were farmers, city workers and people of all ages in attendance. Spanish nationalism is central to the Vox Party's identity. For Vox, values and traditions are important. Our way of living here, the love for your country, for the people, family and for a better future, that's fundamental. Vox defends the same values I care about. Above all, family, economy, life and our country, Spain. They really care about this way more than any other party. The Vox party will have seen just how successful like-minded political parties have been in Hungary and more recently in Italy. Vox is now the third largest political force by electoral seats in the country and has its sights set on becoming part of the next government. 
Seven years ago, the party didn't have a single seat in Congress, but it surged in popularity following its tough stance against the Catalan independence movement, often criticizing Pedro Sánchez for being too soft in negotiations. This week, Abascal warned of a more confrontational approach to Catalan separatism if elected. The current socialist coalition say any involvement of the far right at the highest level could be disastrous. Ultra-right parties that they don't believe in climate change, they don't believe in gender violence, they think that they are very much against migration policies. Migration uh, itself, you know, they are being very aggressive. They want to, to fight the consensus in our country. God knows why is going to happen if these people get into government and the tension with Catalonia and other, and other uh, regions. An Ipsos poll showed that over 60% of Spaniards are worried about Vox getting into power. But recent regional election results seem to point to a Partido Popular Vox coalition in power by next week, as the rise of the right continues across Europe. Ken Brown, CGTN, Toledo. Supermarkets across the UK have been told to make their prices clearer to help shoppers compare and find the best deals. The Competition and Markets Authority says imprecise labelling is confusing to consumers and it called on the government to tighten the law. Under the current rules, products should be priced per unit, but the CMA discovered a lack of transparency with missing or incorrectly calculated unit pricing information both in stores and online. Well, in our new series, Paying the Price, we look at the impact the cost of living crisis is having on people in Europe. In Hungary, food insecurity is growing. Over the last year, the country's largest food bank association says more families have relied on food donations to make ends meet. Our correspondent, Pablo Guterres, reports. Life has been hard for Agnes Farkas since she lost her job more than a year ago. The mother of four worked for years at a small shop that was forced to close down when Hungary's rising inflation and the energy crisis squeezed all its profits. Since then, Farkas has relied on food donations to feed her family. We get here all the food we need for the week. They also give us diapers and even school supplies. It's a big help for me. Farka's family is one of more than 200 that rely on weekly donations from a community food bank in one of Budapest's poorest districts. For families struggling to put food on their table, grocery stores are no longer an option, so they have to rely on food banks like this one, which are now in turn struggling to meet the growing demand. Hungary's year-on-year -year inflation is 21.9 percent, the highest in the EU. The government blames the Ukraine conflict for the country's economic downturn. Economists disagree, saying Hungary's productivity has slowed and the nation's budget deficit has ballooned, and that has driven up inflation. The rising cost of living and a wave of small business closures has disproportionately hurt those on the lowest incomes. We hear all kinds of stories when they come for donations. Some families don't have a stable income anymore. Others are single-parent homes with two or three children and don't earn enough money. In January of 2022, the government placed price caps on essential food items to try to fight off inflation. But according to Hungary's Food Bank Association, the caps have hurt the donations they used to receive from food chains. The uh, retailers started to be more cautious and careful in terms of ordering the, the goods and, uh, and uh, warehousing the goods, so there is less surplus. More than 250,000 people receive help from Hungary's Food Bank Association, and that number is rising fast. That's why the group is now reaching out to restaurants and schools for donations, making sure that no food goes to waste. Pablo Gutierrez, CGTN, Budapest. It's a custom that dates back to the 12th century. For hundreds of years, representatives of the British royal family have counted the swans along a stretch of the River Thames. 
It's known as Swan Upping. Its original purpose was to ensure the centerpiece for medieval feasts. These days, the ritual is still carried out, but with conservation in mind. Our correspondent, Catherine Drew, reports. This colourful tradition dates from a time when the British Crown claimed ownership of all unmarked swans along the Thames. It's known as Swan Upping, and while these swans are no longer counted to ensure a supply for royal feasts, there is a serious purpose, to track the population. Well, the swan population has been uh, pretty grim, really. It's only half the amount of cygnets so far this week that we've actually caught uh, compared with last year. So it is quite disastrous, really. Avian flu has had a major impact on the UK's wild birds since the recent outbreak in 2021. This year, experts say there are fewer families with smaller broods. A lot of pairs have been lost due to the avian flu, but thankfully we're not seeing much of avian flu at the moment. But I would say that it's going to be always there like COVID, and we, learn, we have to learn to live with it. River pollution and vandalism have also taken a toll on these birds, while they were also badly affected by spring flooding. Yeah, mainly because we had a lot of flood water between sort of April and when the birds were starting to nest. Nests get washed away. These are fairly big cygnets, but we have seen some smaller ones. They were probably the result of a second brood where they lost a, a clutch of eggs first time round. This is delicate work. The cygnets are still only a few weeks old, and so the parents are very protective. The birds are lifted out of the water and they're weighed and they're measured and also checked for disease and injury. Now the young cygnets get tangled in fishing tackle a lot. We do have serious problems with that because they're not really streetwise like the adult birds. So, you know, we do have a lot of injuries like that. We take them to the um, swan rescue organisations. The five-day census over a 127-kilometre stretch of the river also serves to educate people about these majestic birds. And while there is plenty of swan handling this week, the main message is to leave the swans to enjoy their natural habitat in peace. Catherine Drew, CGTN. Henley on Thames. The headlines again. China's President Xi Jinping greets former top United States diplomat Henry Kissinger, the man credited with bringing the two countries together back in the 1970s. Our other headlines. Ukraine's port cities under attack for a third night as EU ministers warn of a global food crisis. And wildfires across Greece continue to burn after destroying huge areas of forests. Now there are warnings of a new heat wave to come. And that is The World Today. Thank you for watching. There's more news on CGTN Europe's channel on the Telegram app or scan the QR code on the screen to get stories and updates sent direct to your phone. We're back with more news at the top of this hour. Coming up next, it's World Insight. For now, from all of the team in London, it's goodbye.